This sermon is titled, Only a Small Jar of Oil. Be enriched as you listen. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. You may be seated. And I just want to say a very big thank you to Pastor Ashish, to Sister Amy, to all of you for this gracious invitation to be here and uh, had a great time lady, with the ladies yesterday and just wonderful. And I thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to be here with you. I love meeting old friends and new and uh, just believe that God is here with us in a very special way today. Now, when, you, when I was <laughs> thinking, the pastor read the introduction, and he said, senior pastor, when you see me, you think, yeah, now I know why they call them seniors. <laughs> I am a senior. <laughs> and uh, I've been in India, Pastor Ashish. I came with my husband in 1975, and as a child and a teenager, I lived here 11 full years. I think I'm in six, my 61st year in India. So most of you aren't even that old. <laughs> when I meet young people and, and tell them how long I've been in India, they usually say, I wasn't even born then. <laughs> That's always very humbling. <laughs> but it's, I just have to say it's been my greatest joy and number one, to serve the Lord, to be a servant of the Lord. Number two, to be in India. Because I grew up here as a child, it's always had a very, very special place in my heart. I think that's why I'm still here, even though some people, especially my family, thinks I should be there with them. But in God's time... In God's time. I do want to share from the Word of God this morning. And first of all, I'm just going to read a story that you find in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 4. And I'm just going to read the first seven verses. You're familiar with this story. We're going to talk about this today. 2 Kings, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil, pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Father, we would just want to say thank you this morning. Thank you that we have the freedom to be here in the house of the Lord this morning. We do consider it a privilege to be able to have fellowship with one another, to have fellowship with you, to be here in your presence, to rejoice and to worship you. Now, Father, as we take this time to look into your word, we just pray that you will speak your thoughts to our heart and we'll give you praise for everything you do. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. This is a story about a preacher's family. And I grew up in a preacher's house. My parents were missionaries. And uh, so I always felt a little bit of identification with this story. A man from the company of the prophets. But imagine the plight of this poor widow. 
We don't actually know from Scripture. It doesn't tell us uh, why her husband was in this serious uh, debt. And perhaps, even though he was in the company of the prophets, he probably was a, a farmer, and that's probably how he earned his living, tilling the land. And we don't know whether he had a bad crop or whether, whether he just got sick and that maybe the sickness cost the money. But for whatever reason, his sudden death left the family without support and without income. So now the crisis is the creditor is coming. The creditor probably referred to a money lender. We see it here still to this day. The money lender took all that they had, but it was still not enough. According to Hebrew law, you read it in the Old Testament, a creditor could take the debtor and they could take their children and they could take them as servants. They were not allowed to treat them like slaves because they were Israelis, but they could keep them as their servants. Think how heartbreaking it would have been for that poor widow, not only to have lost her husband to death, but to lose her sons into servitude. That was the widow's situation. But I believe this morning that there's an even bigger story here, and I'm going to liken this story of the widow and her provision to the bigger family, a bigger family than the prophet's family. And I believe that this is also the story of the church today and her need. You know, when we look around the world, we don't have to look around the world. We just have to look right outside the gates, don't we? The street outside of the church. When we see the city of Bangalore, when we look around India, the need is so great. People are weary and burdened. People uh, all in every walk of life, you, you can see them, the businessman, the housewife, the children going to school, and then those with heavy and heavier burdens, the drug addict, the alcoholic, the juvenile delinquent. Maybe we could consider those with extra burdens, the divorcee, the prisoners. Everywhere you look around us, there is great need. There's the sick. <laughs> Seems like half of the world is sick. There's such a problem. Millions were affected in the last two years alone by COVID. This is my feeling. Anyone who's here this morning who has not had COVID, you are in the minority. That's all I can say. Everybody I know has had COVID, including me. I've had it. So uh, <laughs> there's sickness. And actually one of the biggest problems in the world today is not even our physical health, but it's our mental well-being. So much depression. So many people uh, under great trauma in their lives because of physical, pro uh, mental, I'm sorry, and the, the problems of the mind. And this is a great, great problem in the world today. I read that people are spending more now on drugs for their mind than they are on for their body. Do you think that's true, Amy? That seems almost unbelievable. I, I read that. You can't always believe everything you read, but I found that interesting. The problem of society is really bigger than the world can bear. It just seems uh, impossible. And the world looks to us, the church of Jesus Christ, and it says, the creditor has come. Is there an answer? Is there an answer? We're going to just look and go through the things that Elisha did in this story. Let's see how he brought a solution. Actually, the second verse gives a very generous offer. I want to talk about the offer. Elisha said, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? 
I don't think when she heard those words, she felt very encouraged because her answer was kind of sad. She said, there's nothing at all. And then I think kind of as an afterthought, she just said, well, except one little jar of olive oil. No food, no provisions, but just that little bit was all she had to meet her great need. But it's interesting that he asked first, what do you have? It, God often begins, and I think he always begins, with what he, we have. What do you have? He doesn't come from outside with some big, miraculous intervention. But he starts where we are with what we have. I, I think about uh, Moses. Remember when God came to Moses, he said, what do you have in your hand? He's just this rod. This is my staff that I use for the sheep. Nothing special, probably old and worn out. And then, of course, God said, throw it down. <laughs> it became a snake. God took what Moses had. He used what he had to, to actually uh, perform great miracles and a great delivery for the children of Israel. Uh, Jesus, when he was here on the earth, and they said, Lord, we need to feed these people, now we need to let them go and get food, they said. And Jesus said, well, what do you have? And that was a startling thought. And they checked around and found out we only have five little loaves and four fish. Or was it backwards? I'm saying. And he just said, give it to me. And the great provision that he made. God's purpose is not to discover our deficiency or our lack, our poverty. He knows full well. But in his love, he wants to show us what he can do for us if we yield to him the little that we have. But when we look at the inventory of the widow, she said this, I have nothing except a small pot of oil. Now, that seems to indicate her total lack of resources. And that little bit, which is worth almost nothing, was probably said with an apology, sad inventory. But I want to look for just a moment at the inventory of the early church. When Jesus left and he went back to heaven, what did he leave behind for the church to work with? There were no church buildings. There were no sound systems. There was no financial backing. They were actually a persecuted church. There was nothing that they had except, and we're going to talk about it, the oil. They did have a little jar of oil. But I want to look at the church today. Let's take an inventory. If Jesus would come and walk in our midst today, and if he would ask us, what do you have in the house? I'm always afraid when I examine myself, even when I examine my church, I don't want the reverse to be true, that we have everything. I mean, we have, we are so blessed because we finally have our own church, Pastor Ashish. It took us more than 30 years to actually have our own church and almost 35 and it's, it's a great blessing, but we have our own church building. We have a, a good sound system. We have our worship team. We, we have so many resources now. God has been good, and God has given our people employment. People are working, and people are tithing. God has blessed the church with so many things. We have our programs. We have our events. We, those are wonderful things, but I ask myself, and I'm asking you this morning, do we have the oil? Sometimes we have everything, but maybe except for the jar of oil. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And we need to think about it this morning. Do we have his presence? Do we have the anointing of the Holy Ghost in our services? Do we have the power that comes from the Holy Spirit? 
Let's just think about it for a minute. Why? Why do we emphasize it? Why do we need the Holy Spirit? When you look at the things that the Spirit provides, first of all, He is the source of the fruit of the Spirit, those wonderful gifts that God gives, love, joy, peace, perseverance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If you don't have the oil, you may be in short supply of the fruit of the Spirit. He gives you strength to live a consecrated or holy life. The Holy Spirit distributes those wonderful ministry gifts of the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge and faith, the gifts of healing and the working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, speaking in tongues and interpretation. All of those gifts, their source is the Holy Spirit. What kind of a church would we have if we didn't have the ministry gifts? It is the Holy Spirit that gives us the power for witnessing. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. How important is that precious oil? Without the Holy Spirit, there would be no Bible, no faith, no new birth, no holiness, no Christian witness in all the world. In other words, there would be no Christians at all without the Holy Spirit. Without the oil, there would be nothing. So as we look at the need of the world today, are we depending on our own ability or are we looking for the supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit? Let's think about it this morning. Is this oil flowing? in all people's church today. But I think we need to take a moment and do an oil check of our own life. We're not here to do an oil check of the church because I trust the pastor and the ministerial staff. They're, they're going to keep, they keep an oil check. I know they do. But what about you as an individual? You know, some people, they lean on their husband or their wife for their spirituality. There has to be someone godly in the family. You know how many people have talked to me and they they saying their credentials, they say, my uncle was a bishop. Hooray. I mean, that's good. Good for you and good for your uncle. I just want to know, what about you, beloved? What about your life? How are, how are things in your life? Sometimes we depend on an evangelist, a pastor, a godly friend. When we get in trouble, we're looking to others to bail us out. How suddenly the words of this story could come true. Your servant is, my husband is dead. So many times the things that we depend upon can be just swept away and we're left standing alone. The question is, how will you carry on? How will you meet your obligation? How will you fulfill your testimony before the world? Do you have what you can depend upon to be strong in the time of great need? I, I, when I think of this, I remember how gently the Holy Spirit spoke to me after my husband passed away. It'll be, it was 15 years last month. And he died in Hyderabad. He had a heart attack and he passed away there. I didn't, I went back to America. I took his body there for burial because he, my daughters were there, his siblings and family members. And uh, so we had a funeral there. And then the, I don't know if you call it the battle, began to rage in my own heart. Now what am I going to do? And of course, I have two daughters, and they were just ready for me to be there and to be with them. If you have daughters, you know that they always want mama to be close, close by. <laughs> they wanted me to stay. But the Holy Spirit just kept tugging on my heart, tugging on my heart. Because, you know, when I had come to India in 1975 with, with my husband, 
I didn't come because I was his wife and I just was coming along to keep him company. I came because God, God gave me a call. I had a burden on my heart to minister. And I knew that God wanted me to come back. So one day I said to my daughter, I, wanna, I, would, I feel like God wants me to go back to India. Uh, how would you feel about it? <laughs> she asked me one question. She said, are you doing it for them or are you doing it for you? <laughs> she said, if you're doing it for them, I've sacrificed enough for them. She lived for many years without her parents being near her. But she said, if you're doing it for you, if you're sure that's what God wants you to do, I'll stand with you. <laughs> and I said, I'm doing, it for, I'm doing it for me because if I don't please God, if I don't do what he wants, I know that I won't be content. But at the same time I was arguing with God, I was telling him all the reasons why I wasn't adequate to, I was uh, associate pastor, pastor and I were co-pastors from the beginning. But he did the preaching, he was the administrator, you know, he had those giftings, mine were in different areas. And so I, I told the Lord, Lord, I can't preach like pastor preached and I can't be an administrator like he did. I told him all the things I couldn't do, which of course he knew very well. I didn't, but I reminded him anyway, just in case he forgot. And then the Holy Spirit so gently spoke just one sentence to my heart. And he said this, can you obey? <sighs> yes. Yes, Lord. I can obey. So I did. I came back. I, I saw the, the hand of God in so many ways. I never dreamed. And uh, I don't think that coming back made me a great uh, preacher <laughs> or a great administrator, but I said, Lord, I can obey. I will obey. I'll do what you want me to do. I think about the church around the world. I think of the church in North Korea, in Iraq, and in Iran, in Afghanistan, the, the, the per, in China, the persecuted church. And then I realize that, that the persecuted church is a lot closer than we ever dreamed, isn't it? It's here. It's here. I tell my pastors, we have to work. We have to work because night is coming. There are places in India where night has already come, beloved. We have the persecuted church. It's, it's coming. It's spreading in this part of the world. In those areas, their property has been confiscated. Churches have been destroyed. There's just, uh, they, every friend has been cut off. You don't even know who you can trust, who you can even share with, because they may be an informer and, and get you in trouble. What is left for those churches? How do they manage? How do they even manage to thrive in those conditions? They still have a small jar of oil. There is still that power of the Holy Spirit. The answer today is the same as it was in the second chapter of Acts. Those, that was a persecuted church. They uh, faced the antagonism of not only people that weren't believers, but the church, the Christians, the Jews, actually, were very antagonistic. And they were certainly against the moving of the Holy Spirit. The preacher Stephen was martyred. Not long after that, James, the brother of John, was killed by the sword. The apostles were beaten, imprisoned, stoned. You just have to read uh, the, from Acts through the epistles. The story is chilling sometimes. How did they remain victorious? How did they turn their world upside down? They had a jar of oil. Hallelujah. They just, they worked and they ministered in the miracle flow of that oil. The words of Jesus to the little family before he left the earth. They sound a little bit familiar to this Old Testament story. The master said this, nevertheless, I tell you, it is for your good 
that I go away. If I do not go away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. There is no answer for the needs of this world outside of that oil, outside of the Holy Spirit. But I want to go back to the story for a moment to look at the promise, the wonderful promise in uh, the verses 3 and 4. First of all, oh, the wind keeps blowing it away. Here it is. <laughs> if I don't hold it down, the page turns. But I know the story. I could do it without the page, couldn't I? The prophet said to the widow, go ask all your neighbors for empty jars. This is something that I, I think is, is just so interesting. At the, the key to what God is going to do is always faith. Why do I say this? Look, notice the action verbs. Go. First, he starts there. Ask. And I, I, I was thinking of James, the second chapter, where it talks about faith and deeds. I'm not going to go there, but it ends the whole portion from the verse 14 in James chapter 2 ends without, with these words, without faith. Without, not without faith. He's talking about faith. Without deeds, faith is dead. It's dead. You have to do something. You have to act. So first of all, he said, go and ask all your neighbors for jars. Don't ask for just a few. He gave them the warning. Then he went on with this command. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour the oil into all the jars. And as each is filled, put it to one side. Go, ask, shut Poor. He, you, their faith demanded action. She couldn't just sit there and, and just hold her hands out for God to do. She had to work. The exercise of faith is always go out, come in. Faith sends me to every neighbor to ask for empty vessels. And I'm sure when you look around your city, you find many empty vessels. But I've always found this very interesting. The flow started only when she was alone with God. Go inside and shut the door behind you. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, especially in this day when everything is about media <laughs> and everything's about the Internet. And, uh, you know, it, we're, we're so... Uh, I don't know what's the word. We want everyone to see everything and tell everything. We don't, you know, if, if we have a, we go out to dinner, we take a picture of the food and we send it. I mean, everything. I, I'm, I'm amazed sometimes at the pictures people send. That's more than I want to know. I mean, I'm sorry. I like food, but you know, I'm not that interested. You, everything we do, people go on vacation. Every, they have to send pictures. You, I sent a picture yesterday to my secretary because she worked to help me get here. I took a picture in front of the backdrop and I said, look at the backdrop. I matched. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was wearing the same color. You know, I'm part of the, I'm just part of this generation, I guess. We love to let everybody know everything. But you know, I think sometimes there can be a danger of too much display. You know, he said, go in and shut the door. I'm not sure why he said that. Perhaps if they had kept it open and the neighbors would have been peeking, they would have been, of course, what in the world are they up to with all those jars? There would have been lack of faith. Somebody would have said, what? Oh, so, you know, what's that about? Or, you know, doubt maybe could have come. Uh, uh, unbelief. But it reminds me of when Je what Jesus said to his disciples. He said this about prayer. When you pray, go into your room and close the door. <laughs> and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret, what he'll reward you openly. There's a spiritual principle there, isn't it? 
Uh, I, I find so often nowadays religion is kind of a high price publicity campaign, but I still believe, beloved, that true religion is it's a communion. It's between you and God. You don't start on TV. You don't start on the internet or on social media. You need to go in and shut the door. You need to have that personal, private time. You need to have the oil. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to look for just a minute at some of the promises that God made to the church before he went away. These are some things he said. You know what I ought to do? No, I'll read that later. I'll just give the promises right now. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. In a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They didn't even know exactly what he was talking about, but he promised. And then he promised at the last chapter of the book of Mark, just before he ascended to heaven, Whoever believes, he said, go preach the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Next verse, he says, they'll speak in new tongues. Don't you think they wondered what that meant? That was pre-Pentecost. Jesus was just before the ascension. They probably thought, what in the world's that? Another promise Jesus made. They will place their hands on the sick. And they will get well. Thank the Lord for that promise. These are the promises that God made. Bring the vessels. Bring your vessels. I have things. I'll fill them to overflowing. I have good things to give you. Salvation. Holy Spirit baptism. Healing in mind and body. I just hope that when people come to the, our churches, to the church of Jesus Christ, that we're not a powerless church. I think of the disciples. Remember when they went out to minister two by two and a father came back to Jesus and he said this in Mark the ninth chapter, Master, I brought you my son who's uh, possessed by a spirit that throws him to the ground. Then this, Sad commentary. I ask your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. They could not. Thank God there's a totally different answer <laughs> after the oil was poured out. Remember when Peter and John went to the temple and that lame man was sitting there and they said in the name of Jesus. First of all, they said, we don't have any silver or gold. We can't, he was just sitting there begging. Amma, amma. You know, they said, we don't have any money. But what we have, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we're going to give you that in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. That was after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When the oil came, there was a big difference in the lives of the disciples. I believe today this world wants, this world needs action. It doesn't just need words. It is weary of words. It's weary of programs. What they want is the answer to this question, what shall I do for you? When we ask that, we, they have an answer. They have so many needs. I believe it's as a church, we just need to lift our voices, cry out, and pray, Lord, send a revival. Like the book of Acts, the book of Acts kind of power. That's what we want to have, that signs and wonders will be done in the name of your holy child, Jesus. And I love the story here in the fourth chapter of Second Kings. The beautiful provision of God in verses 5 and 6. She left him, that's Elisha, and she shut the door. She was good at following instructions. They brought the jars to her. I love this. She kept pouring. I, that's, you know, the marvelous, the abundant provision. As long as the sons had jars, she kept pouring. The, the flow of oil only ceased when they ran out of vessels. Remember, the prophet warned her, don't bring just a few, bring a lot. 
And maybe that's all their neighbors had. I don't know. Or maybe, you know how kids are. You'd send them out to do something. They get tired after a while. They take shortcuts. You know, I had daughters. I know how that goes. You know, they, they came back and she said, is this all? And she said, yeah, mom, this is all. I, I don't know. But that's how many they brought. And that's how many she filled. The amount of oil she received was limited. It was according to your faith. The scripture says, according to your faith, let it be to you. So often we think just one great act of faith is, going to, is all that's needed to receive from the Lord. We, I believe that we often stop short of the things that God intends for us. I believe he would do more if we had more vessels. I believe he would do more if we would tarry in his presence longer. I believe he would do more if we would spend more time on our knees. We shortchange the power that God could give us. We shortchange the things that God would love to do for us because our vessels are few. But I, I'm going to go. We're going to talk about the early church. i got to go back here to Acts, the second chapter. Don't you love the second chapter of Acts? Oh, yes. And I, we, we'll just have to, we have to read those verses. There's nothing like reading them out loud. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What a wonderful... The promise fulfilled. Jesus said, wait. They waited. And... This was what happened on the day of Pentecost. They began to speak in other tongues. We do note that those other two evidences of the, the uh, infilling that day, the tongues of fire, the wind, that was what you would call a one-time evidence, I believe, because we don't see that today. At least I've never seen it. I don't know if you have, but I have never seen that. But I believe that was a one-time evidence for that first infilling. But something that repeats itself over and over in the book of Acts, in the epistles, is the evidence of speaking in tongues. That was not a one-time evidence. You see it in, th throughout the rest of the New Testament. We see it today in our churches, the evidence of tongues. But what I love, and this is what impresses me so much when I read this, it's there in the fourth verse, all of them were, they got a little bit. They all got a little bit. Is that what it says? They didn't get a little bit. They were filled. They were filled. They were filled. It wasn't just a drop. It wasn't just a little dribble. You know, sometimes... I, you know, nowadays it's not as bad as it used to be, the water pressure and the water. You turn on the tap and it's just like, T -t 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 -t. finished, you know, oh no. Anyway, especially when you've already put shampoo in your hair and you're ready to wash it out and the water stops. I've had that happen. <laughs> they were filled I love that word. They were filled. You know, we see it again in the cha sixth chapter when the apostles, they were selecting men to minister to the widows. And they said, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit. You know what that suggests? The inference here is there were others in the church who weren't so full. Because he said, pick the ones that are full of the Holy Spirit. If the blessings are no longer flowing in your life, if things have been a bit dry, if new blessings and gifts of the Spirit, graces are not apparent in your life, you need to just check your oil level. Perhaps the oil level is not as it should be. I want us all to heed Paul's advice to the Ephesian believers, be filled with the Spirit. God is willing. There is no oriole shortage in heaven. Praise the Lord. He is willing. But we have to have the vessels. We have to be available. 
Then there's the great obligation there in the back in Second Kings. She, you know what? It struck me. I was reading that story early this morning, and I don't have it in my notes, but I'm allowed to say it even if I didn't write it down. Might throw the guys in the back off, but there is not a jar left. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me. If you don't want the oil to stop flowing, you have to keep the vessels coming. You have to keep being available. And I, I just prayed, Lord, help me. Help me not to shortchange what you can do. And I don't want you to say about me, and I don't want you to say about my congregation and my church and all people's church, there's not a jar left. They don't need, they don't need any more. The oil stopped. But she went and she told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil, and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. She had a debt to pay. The fact that God was working in a miraculous way did not erase the demands of the creditor. She still had a debt to pay. And the marvelous thing is, not only did she receive enough money to pay off the debt, which she did when she sold all the oil, she had enough left for you and your sons to live on. Isn't that beautiful? God's abundant supply. He is not only uh, concerned with our crisis need, but he is concerned with our daily needs. My father will supply your daily needs. The scripture is so clear about that. God would take care of her. How good God is. Maybe this morning you find yourself in a financial crisis. I just want to say, if you call on him, if you let the oil flow through your life, God is capable of meeting every need according to his riches. I love that. Not my riches. According to his riches in glory. Now, what is the church's obligation? We hear it. The apostle Paul says it in Romans chapter 1 and verse 14. He says, I am a debtor. In the King James, uh, the NIV, it says, I am obligated. I am obligated to the Greeks and to the non-Greeks, to the wise and to the unwise. The world, beloved, is asking from you, from on the street where you live, perhaps in the flats where you live, in the office where you work, in the school where you teach, the world is, they're coming and asking. Sometimes they don't ask, but we know the need. The creditor is come. You and I have an obligation. I am obligated. The interesting thing is, Christ made the promises, and the world has come to collect. He made all the promises. He was the head of the family. As the head of the family, he passed on these promises. He promised to save, to heal, to sanctify, make you holy, to baptize. He says he'll come again. All of these are God's promises. He made them, and then he went away. He went back to heaven, and he left a struggling little group of people in the upper room to meet all of the promises that he had made. <laughs> Doesn't it seem like a, a bit of a heavy load, didn't it? The creditor has come, and Christ made the promises, but it's our responsibility, beloved, as his children, as his church. It is our obligation. The, it's up to you and me to see that the promises of Jesus Christ are fulfilled. As we look and think about it today, I believe each one of us needs to ask, what do I have in the house? This is your house right here. What do I have? Is my oil tank full? What do we have 
that will need, meet the needs of a clamoring world? Do we have the answer? I always feel so, in, I mean, I say always, I many times feel inadequate when I see the great needs in the city of Hyderabad. Those are the ones that I have to face day by day. And I know that my God is sufficient to meet every need. I know that. But there are days when I, I think I need uh, an influx or an infilling of new oil. I need new strength. I need a new impartation. That's one of the reasons that we come Sunday by Sunday. That's one of the reasons we join in small group ministry and we pray and we have prayer groups and because we have to keep the oil tank full because you never know what needs are going to come your way. Sometimes they're not so major. Sometimes they're very big. The great theologian, Dr. Lyman Beecher was asked on his deathbed, Dr. Beecher, will you please tell us what you consider the greatest work a man can do in this world? The greatest work a man can do in this world, he replied, is to lead a soul to Jesus. We want to do dramatic things. I like dramatic things. I like miraculous healings. There's so many wonderful things that God does, but I just want to challenge you this week. You can witness to somebody about Jesus Christ. When you have that oil, you have the power to witness. You can do it. The world has the vessels. God has the oil, but it is our responsibility to get the oil into those vessels. Every time we have a new year, uh, begin a new year, I, I, I feel it so strongly. And I, I make a new resolution every year. Lord, I'm going to win more souls this year than ever before. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be shy. I'm going to speak your name. I'm going to witness to the people that I rub shoulders with. It's, it's a little bit hard for pastors. Hard in the sense, I'm in the office all day. You know what I work with? Believers. <laughs> I don't rub shoulders, but I look at you and you're rubbing elbows, not maybe not shoulders. We rub elbows, don't we? And where are you on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday? You're in the office, perhaps you're at the school, you're working all over the city and you're, you're living in neighborhoods where everybody is not a believer. You have opportunity. There are people you meet every day who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, that he is a savior who not only can save, he can heal, he can deliver. You have the oil. I just, I'm going to close, and I don't know how long I was supposed to go. I probably went over. I forgot to ask. I really, really meant to ask before I started. I apologize. But because I didn't, I'm... I'm free from guilt. <laughs> Examine your own heart today, beloved. <laughs> Am I full? Am I full? Is my tank half empty? As we come here in his presence today, precious Holy Spirit, we just pray. We thank you. We thank you, Father. I thank you that you sent Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, that you came. I thank you, Lord, that you gave us the oil. I'm so thankful that there is power in the oil. Lord, I have no power, but in you I have. Lord, when I'm weak, then I'm strong because you'll give me power. So, Father, we just look in our hearts today. We say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, help me be honest and say, what do I have? What do I have in my house? Have I let you fill me? Have I let you use me? Have I let you flow through me to the glory of God and to the building of your kingdom? We pray. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Lord, bless your church. I pray a very special blessing on all people's church. Lord, I thank you that they've spread out from the north to the south, from the east to the west. Lord, I thank you for the witness in this city. I thank you for all the... Uh, abundance of teaching and training. Lord, I thank you because they are working day and night to 
meet their obligation, Lord, to pay the debt. And I just pray that you would give them great grace and that you would increase the flow of the Spirit of God in this place and that you would increase the harvest that many, many, many who know, don't know you now will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, bless your church. Bless your children. And Lord, use us all for the glory of God. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And while they're getting ready, I'm going to make this one last comment. I wrote it down and I believe it. The church of Jesus Christ will always meet the needs of this world as long as it depends on the miracle flow of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Pastor Arlene Stubbs. Let's just appreciate her time and ministry here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's rise to our feet, please. And take a few moments right now just to let this word soak into your heart and the things that you and I need to pray about. Let's do that. Some of us, whatever the Lord has spoken to you through the word this morning, take a few moments to pray. And say, Lord, I receive that word. I receive it for my life. There may be things that we need to go and do. Let's go do it. Let's go before God and say, Lord, I'll do it. Maybe we need to go and shut the door just to be in His presence. Go do it. Maybe we need to go out and pour, pour out what God has poured into you. Go do it. Let's take a few moments just to pray and just look to the Lord.
Thank you, God. And Father, we just receive your words and we receive the work of the ministry of your spirit into our hearts, into our lives. And what you've spoken to us, what you've released to us this morning, will continue to just minister to us and move us, Lord, into the, into the action that you want each one of us to take, into the things you want us to do. We receive your words. We receive the work of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, God. Thank you. And we thank you, Father, for touching our lives, for meeting our needs, for healing, for delivering for turning things around in our life situations, even as we obey your word, as we obey what you've spoken. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Father. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit Continue with each of us always in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.